If you're wondering how artificial intelligence tool development for pathology can be made widely available and democratized for the pathology community, this is for you. Hi, I'm Alexandra Zhurev and I'm here to help you do better digital pathology and tissue image analysis. So if you are interested in that, be sure to subscribe, click the bell below to be notified every time I release a new video. This video is an interview I did with two leaders of the Big Picture project, Julie Boisclair and Jeroen van der Lack. Big Picture is a European Union private-public initiative, private-public project that aims at developing slide repository, whole slide image repository, a huge one with millions of slides that will be available for artificial intelligence tool developer in Europe and later across the globe. Welcome everyone. Big picture, so if you're working in drug development or are even remotely interested in digital pathology and tissue image analysis and know that you need a lot of data for deep learning, you've probably heard this initiative, big picture. Everybody's talking about collecting images for developing generalizable algorithms that can help accelerate drug development and improve healthcare in general, patient care as well. So this is a big initiative, and if you're not part of it, you probably heard of it, peripherally know what this initiative is about, that it's going on, and it's called Big Pictures. So there's gonna be many, many, many pictures, as pathology slides. This is why the project is called like that. But for those not directly involved, we meet here today with two of the project leader leaders uh, that are here with me. Welcome. I have Jeroen van der Laak here and Julie Boisclair. Jeroen is a full professor at Radboud University in the Netherlands, and uh, he is also the co-organizer of the famous Chameleon Challenges, Image Analysis Challenges for Detecting Breast Cancer Metastasis in Lymph Nodes. And Julie Boisclair, she's a veterinary pathologist as myself, and she has over 20 years of experience both in CROs and pharma uh, in the non-clinical part of drug development. And she is leading the non-clinical part of digital pathology and computational pathology efforts at Novartis. Welcome, both of you. I'm super happy to have you here today. Thank you, Alexandra. Thanks for inviting us. So I hope Thank my you. intro to the Big Picture Initiative was not too confusing. But even if it was, we're going to talk about what that is. We're going to answer the question, what is it? Why is it even organized? Who's doing it? And it's a long-term initiative. Once we cover the basics, the what, why, and who, we're going to talk about what has already been done. So without further ado, I uh, leave the stage to you. So Jeroen, before we dive into the big picture, do you want to say a couple more words about yourself? Sure, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Alexandra. Um, yes, so my name is uh, Jeroen van der Laak, and as you said, uh, I'm a professor of computational pathology in, uh, in the Netherlands, Rambart University Medical Center. I am also a guest professor in uh, Linköping in Sweden, and I, I am the, uh, the CSO of a, a spin-off company, AUSIN. Actually, I'm not a pathologist like you guys. I am, um, I'm a computer scientist. I studied computer science, and I have been working in the pathology department for close to 30 years now, so a long time. Mm -hmm. And all, those, all this time I have been developing... You've put up with um, pathologists for 30 years? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> that is a, an achievement <laughs> in itself. I should put this on my CV, I think, yes. Uh, my research is really on, uh, so on the development of computation, computer, uh, computerized um, analysis methods of software for histopathology which used to be kind of a, a niche thing, but in the last, say, 10 years, now we have whole site imaging and we have modern AI technology. Um, it, it's really become a mainstream thing in pathology. And what we realized more and more actually is that, um, yeah, as you said, to be able to um, to do this and to develop AI for, uh, for pathology, we need lots of data. And that's where a big picture comes in. Okay, thank you, uh, Jeroen, for the intro. And yeah, 30 years uh, in pathology department is a huge achievement. Julie, a couple of words about yourself from yourself. Yeah, 
I'm Canadian. I now live in Switzerland and work for Novartis in Switzerland. I've worked in uh, several places on the planet, so Canada, US, and also uh, in, in Europe. And um, I, I'm, I was here. always a, an early adopter of new technologies, including digital pathology. So I've been using digital pathology since several, several years, uh, probably since the you know, since it's in fence several, well, 15 years ago or so. So I remember starting in in, um, in Novartis and already playing with, with digital images. But at that time, we were not as ambitious as we are now. So those images were used for a very specific use case. And, and, and now we are uh, seeing this as a, as a really a, a way to completely revolutionize the way we will perform pathology in the future and improve our life. So uh, being more efficient, for example, being better also. This way we, we really see that as a kind of help for the pathologist. So uh, that's why I've been defending this project so ferociously since it, uh, its beginning. Uh, and uh, that's why I wanted to be involved as well. What is big picture? In a nutshell, so big picture, uh, what it is, is a, is a big uh, repository of old slide images and its metadata. And um, it's going to be, uh, it's a, a, a very big project, 70 million. It's going to include 3 million slides. So uh, 2 million of which will come from uh, the, um, uh, the non-clinical node. And 1 million will come from the clinical node. It's going to be very diverse, so different species, a lot of different disease. So um, by doing so, then we are uh, becoming the catalyst for uh, the development of AI models. But having this uh, repository that is uh, open and that, uh, that, can be ac that, that is accessible also. Mm -hmm. And why did this start? I mean, the general why I understand, because everybody wants to develop those algorithms and there's no place to find all those slides. But why now and why in this uh, forum that you are doing it? So the why, I think uh, for me, um, I, I found that increasingly we, we have seen, so we, we organized, for instance, the Chameleon Challenge, in which we shared uh, 1,400 scan slides with pretty much everyone. And we've seen that uh, over 1,500 research groups downloaded those 1,500 slides, 1,400 slides. So we noticed there was a huge hunger for data in, in the pathology, in the digital pathology domain and people working on AI and pathology. And from our own experience, we found that we were increasingly trying to, to, to get to collaborations. Uh, my, my time was really, I was spending a lot of time on, on uh, data transfer agreements and material transfer agreements. And we found that increasingly people needed data and bigger and bigger data sets to produce AI and to validate AI for pathology. So we see on one hand the, the possibilities of AI for pathology, but also we see that the biggest hurdle for, for everyone in the field, not just for academics, but also for, for pharma research and for companies, small companies, large companies, is really the lack of good quality data and, and associated metadata. Um, so we realize that uh, AI can play a big role. It says here, uh, we will be able to, to get better knowledge of diseases by, by studying uh, uh, all kinds of disease tissue sections with AI. It can lead to better treatment. Um, it can improve our diagnostic accuracy, efficiency, and especially, of course, in the, 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 the tox uh, path world, it can help to replace, reduce, and refine animal research. Um, but we realize to really be able to develop meaningful applications, we need lots of data. So that's why we started to, um, to set a big picture. So did you initiate it, Jeroen? Who's like, who said we're doing this? It's basically it's a combination. The, mm -hmm. um, the granting scheme that, that Big Picture is part of, which is called IMI, it's a European um, Union granting scheme in which principally uh, pharmaceutical companies together with the European Union define projects, uh, let's say, they, they uh, get out a call in which they say, okay, we would like to have people um, apply for a grant which will do this and this and this. 
So basically from the pharmaceutical company side, there was a clear need to do this. And we as academics, we saw the call, we read the call, and we realized this was exactly what we were actually thinking about for a long time already. Um, so we wrote a project proposal for this, um, which was reviewed. There were a number of competing um, uh, proposals. Um, and yeah, we won the bit, so to say. After that, the pharmaceutical companies entered, um, let's say, the consortium, and together we, we, uh, we wrote the final text and we developed uh, the project as it is now. Mm -hmm. um, so if you say, who is doing this? So basically, at a, at a larger scale, we would like it to be very inclusive. So the community that we aim for is, is even much broader than the consortium that we're doing this with. Um, the the community, community could be what you can see here. So a pathologist, but also SMEs, um, governmental organizations, regulatory agencies, um, researchers, pharma, startup companies. The consortium itself is in my next slide. And the consortium itself is uh, 46 Before parties. Before we go to the consortium, Jeroen, can you mm -hmm. go back one slide? Tell me about your logo. This pink thing, I assume these are some nodes of a convolutional neural network, the blue dots. But what's the pink thing? Is this a cell? The tissue. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's taken a lot of time to get to the logo, uh, Alex. And um, actually, it's not a neural network. It's a, oh, okay. a connection a connection of um, of different parties in the, in the community. So it's connecting pathologists, companies uh, in kind of a network. But of course, you, you can you can see many things in it. And the, the yeah, pink thing we, we jokingly call the pink thing the potato. Um, it does look the, like a potato. <laughs> yeah, the previous so version even looked, the previous version was <laughs> even more like a potato. It's a, it, it originally was a cell. So someone, someone, the designer that made it made a cell and within it was kind of a network. Uh, and it was shaped a bit differently now, um, but it's it's yeah it's supposed to be a cell and it has the H and E color scheme a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, if uh, you are listening as, uh, on the podcast, then I'm gonna put this in the show notes, the picture of the logo. And if you're on YouTube, then you know exactly what we're talking about. So the uh, the consortium that is doing the project now is 46 parties, um, of which 10 are pharmaceutical companies and 36 are. Uh, it's it's a mix of uh, small medium enterprises, academic um, uh, centers, but also smaller hospitals. Uh, we have regulatory um, uh, agencies in it, so it's really a very diverse mix of people, because we want to tackle um, many different aspects of this. So we also have legal um, involved to look at, uh, let's say, the, the legal landscape. What can we do with data? What what are we allowed to do? Um, it's a very large consortium. Mm -hmm. But this list, like the the people who are involved in this consortium is already closed, right? There's no like, oh, we would like to join uh, as well. Uh, we kind of missed the initial uh, registration, but we want to join you. That's not an option anymore, right? Or am I wrong? Yeah, usually it's not an option, but we have heard the interest of several additional partners and um, we are exploring to see if this is possible or not, but... Uh... I don't want to have anyone have their hopes to why, but uh, we are looking into this. Okay. We, we do. So the, the consortium is close in the sense that the people that get funded by the Euro European Union, that's pretty much closed. So it's going to be tough to add partners. Mm -hmm. But we definitely want to be a very inclusive uh, consortium and, and um, community in the future. So any parties that would like to share their data within big picture, use data in big picture, share AI, build AI on top of big picture. Everyone is welcome because this is not a 46 party effort in the end. It should be much, much bigger effort. So people are really welcome to join this, but will not be able to get funded by the EU because that's, yeah, that's closed for now. The 46 partner are, are bound for six years and that's where everything starts. But after the six years, we call we have what we call sustainability. So we want this repository not to be functional only for six years, but we want it to be functional and, and even growing with with time, right? So if if these partners that have not you know jumped in the 
in the boat early on can jump in the boat later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's then talk about how are you doing it. You're mentioning this is a six year project to build the whole thing, right? And then you have a maintenance program for it when actually people can benefit. How are you organizing this? It seems to me a massive project. How are you doing it? So uh, what we would like to do uh, ultimately is to make the data and the AI, AI, AI tools available so they will coexist. And this is through uh, an international and inclusive community of experts. So don't forget that from the beginning, uh, this is a, a community-based model. So as you have seen us, we are it's multidisciplinary. We are not coming from the same uh, field, even though uh, we, we, you know, Yeruna has coexist 30 years with, uh, with pathologists. So it's really based on, on community and, and sharing. These people are coming from different fields. They are multidisciplinary and, and we really want to, to pave the way for the computational pathology. So the, why it takes six years is to gather 3 million slides, so 4.5 terabytes, it, it takes time. We need to organize with different type of specialists. And, uh, and then we need to build a safe repository in which we will be able to put those uh, 3 million slides and their metadata, make sure that the metadata is a very high quality. Um, it is searchable, so when you want to do your AI model, you will make sure that you are doing it on the right slide. So to do so, we are developing also tools uh, that will help uh, the AI uh, development. Uh, some of these tools, for example, are um, Dicomizer, so you, we can take slides from any format and put them in a, in a Dicom format. Um, I love the Dicomizer. Yeah, annotation tools. Uh, viewers, and uh, uh, then uh, we are also discussing with the health authorities to make sure that up to a point, the AI models that will be built and shared on the, on, on the, the, the database and the repository will be accepted by uh, health authorities. So that's mm -hmm. how uh, it, is, it is built. So there are uh, six uh, work packages that we are calling. So these are the six group within the um, IMI big picture. So the first one work package one is the management group. So this is the one that Yehun and I are leading. Uh, and then there is the one for the repository. So we have the clinical node. So these are the, the pathologists that are gathering all these cases. So the, these 3 million slides are very important deciding also what metadata is important, which one we will include and not include to be able to do those AI models. And then work package for is the, um, uh, these are the scientists that are doing the different tools and the AI models. There will be four use cases that we would like to work on. There will be um, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Uh, there is another case that is, um, I think it's a kidney rejection uh, detection model. Uh, then for non-clinical, we, we do an outlier detection model, so a normal versus abnormal. And also, I think the last one is content-based image retrieval. Mm -hmm. So these are the four cases that the, the work package for will be doing. So to make sure that the repository is of excellent quality so we can test it. And also this will be made available after the, afterwards and can serve as a kind of a accelerator for uh, others to share their models also. Uh, work package five is the one that is uh, more dealing with the regulatory aspect and the legal aspect and the ethical aspect. And uh, the work package six is the one that it will be developing our sustainability model. Mm -hmm. So how far are you in the project now? We are at month 15. <laughs> okay. Out so of it's six very years. early on. So what have you done so far? Like, I assume there is a lot of organizational work uh, going on. So I don't know if you've gone beyond that already, but what have you done in this first year? The repository was put in place and tested. So there was some pilot that, that was going on. Um, 
So the first year is where you, you build the blocks. And after that, you put the blocks together to make the house, right? So, so do you already have slides or you have just a place where to put them? We have a place where to put them okay. and uh, we have a few test cases that we have put in the pilot with mock data, more or less, but mm -hmm. not a huge amount of them. Okay. So the test cases would be the algorithms or the models? No, the test case not cases yet. are, uh, the tests are just test uh, slides with their metadata. We've put in, we have started also to discuss uh, the honest broker aspect. So who's going to be data controller versus contributor. So what's going to be the legal, the legal basis? Because as you know, we will have some clinical data in there and also intellectual properties. So it's important that uh, uh, these um, legal aspects are discussed ahead of time. So we make sure that it is protected and uh, it is not available to, uh, to, to everyone. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's um, good to add that uh, in Europe, every country has their own uh, rules, of course. So there is a European law, um, the GDPR, that regulates a lot of um, issues around personal data, which counts for all of us, but still every country has their own taste of it. Mm -hmm. So one, I think actually quite big effort is done by um, a legal firm that has looked at what are the differences in different European countries and made a big report, which for me as a computer scientist is tough to read, but it contains a lot of data and a lot of information on what can you do with a with a slide a scan slide in Belgium versus France, which could be completely different. Mm -hmm. um, so those are things that are well, they're not really that sexy, um, but still, it's important that we solve this because we, yeah, in the end, it's it's needed to be able to share the slides in the end and to know exactly what we can do and what we can't do. Yeah, so did you discover something that, for example, is going to uh, let some countries take advantage of that and you know that other countries will not be able to take advantage because of some regulations? Do you already have insights? No, I don't ex expect that. So we are all governed by the same uh, rules in this um, in this area, but there are local tastes to it, I think. Um, I don't think that anyone will... Um, benefit more than anyone else. I, I don't expect mm -hmm. it. But it's really important to notice and, and um, actually also to inform the people that are going to upload slides because many, many instances, um, people in pathology labs are also not experts and they often don't know exactly what, what counts for them, right? It's, it's a very complicated landscape. So any help that we can give people is of course very important. Yeah, I think so maybe good. one thing we did not mention is uh who was the instigator of this and I think yes I want to know that who started this <laughs> yeah the Pierre Moulin is the one who kind of made the proposal um so he's it's it came from uh, from his his idea and I remember several years ago he had the same proposal and it was not accepted so it looks like you know, the, we were not yet ready, uh, mm -hmm. but Sarah, you know, when he asked for it, I think, he, what year was it? You know, in 2018, when this, everything started or, or 19? 19, I think. So yes. then, yeah, 2019, then people were ready, right? So uh, I, it's funny to see sometimes people are just ahead of their time and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and yeah. Totally. I think the, the and European Union was not yet ready for, for digital pathology, but now they are. So here we come. <laughs> so I have a question because uh, many of the members of the consortium are international pharma companies. How does that uh, work? Because it's a European consortium, European project, but are you going to be collecting slides from overseas as well? How does, how is that solved? Yeah, so most of the slides are coming from partners that are in Europe, but several partners, for example, Novartis, also have counterparts in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So some of the slides might come from the U.S. And also we have some of the help, you know, for example, the computational uh, pathology group that are helping scientists and things like that might come also from uh, the U.S. But the it's better for IMI 
uh, projects to have uh, most of the contributions that is in the Europe. Mm -hmm. And once it's done, after the six years, can then people from the rest of the world apply and use this data as well, or it's also more Europe restricted? Because I imagine the maintenance of such a huge endeavor and this infrastructure is going to cost money. So uh, how is it going to be financed? Now it's a grant, I assume, uh, that there has been some money uh, that was allocated to this. It's going to be forever, or at least the maintenance is supposed to be long term. How is it going to be financed and is there going to be some like maintenance fees? How do you envision that uh, it's going to happen and for Europeans and for people from outside Europe? I would, I would think that, of course, we will not restrict it to Europe because we will face the same problems all over the world. So um, I think everyone would benefit if it's much bigger than Europe. And I think also, as you say, I think it's, it's, it's an important uh, question, of course, how do you sustain such a thing? Um, we have a work package, as Julie said, dedicated to that. So there's one work package that started already on day one to think about um, ways to to make money, or not to make money, but to, to let's say, to acquire money to keep this alive. Um, they are actively looking into this. We, we can think about uh, even having spin-off companies of the big picture project. Um, and there are many different ways, of course, of, of yeah, uh, uh, getting the funds to uh, to keep this alive, and the bigger it is, and the more let's say countries participate or the more people participate, the the bigger the chance that we will be able to sustain. Um, I think we do not really have the solution at this point. That we, we can't say what it is. Or probably there will you be. You have another five years to come up with it. Yes, luckily. <laughs> but I'm just you know I'm super curious. Is it also the plan another... is you in three years? Okay. Yeah, year three already, we need to have a plan in place and start to put it in place. So in year six, it's up and running. Okay. And do you also have either in your work packages or in the design of the project, some way to adapt to new technologies, which we probably don't yet know what it's going to be. I don't know, maybe some ways of more efficient ways of storing data, more efficient ways of uh, maneuvering data. Um, is there somebody overseeing that? If, if it even is possible to oversee something that we don't really know what it's going to be. Sounds complicated. It's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's good to realize that the, uh, the repository is based on uh, existing technology. So the, um, the EGA, is a genomics uh, archive, um, ha has been in existence for quite some time, and we are, say, adapting that technology uh, for our infrastructure. The infrastructure, it's, so basically what we are developing is a software layer, and the underlying technology probably can change. So, for instance, we would have different ways of storing our data, then still the software that would take keep track of that and take care of that can probably remain the same or has to be adapted. But, of course, the online mm -hmm. hardware, for instance, could change. It's all open source. Mm -hmm. Everyone could benefit from it. And also, uh, yeah, everyone could contribute to it at some point. But, of course, yeah, it, it's not easy to take things into account that we don't know yet. It, it's very, we try to be very adaptable, very open. Um, but I think, yeah, which of there's more that we can do. So, you say it's open source the tools that you're building are going to be open source. How do you manage to have the open source and community and open to everyone component with uh, legal compliance and regulations different in different countries? Uh, and another thing is like keeping, let me phrase it differently, like regulating access to this. Mm -hmm. Is it something that, you know, somebody can take wherever they are and not let you know uh, that they're using it? Or is there going to be a process to access it and to benefit from this? So there will be a process. Um, so this is uh, defined by what we call the honest broker mechanism. Mm -hmm. They will be yeah, the ones doing about that. the regulation of uh, who is putting data in and who is taking data out. And uh, are who is putting 
algorithm in or who is taking algorithm out because as you as we have said earlier it's they coexist together on on the on the repository so um in a nutshell there will be there will be what we call a, a data access committee so the, they will be the one deciding who has access or not, depending on the, uh, on the case that you will provide. So for example, Alexandra, you would like to do a model to detect centrilobular hypertrophy in rat liver. So you will write a kind of uh, a little grant, uh, you will submit it, and then they will revise it, make sure that you are uh, legitimate, you are uh, not an impostor, and then uh, you know they will provide you with access to uh, the data that you need to be able to uh, have your objective that is that is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So basically, like an application process to whoever is going to be taking care of this. Yes. Okay. And we need to make sure that this is not too cumbersome, also, as we want this to be open being secure but not too cumbersome so we don't want it to take six months before you are granted access because we don't we want to be a catalyst not a not a break to uh, to development right mm -hmm. maybe so uh, Alex, another, another question another, another angle to this um actually i asked the exact same question that you just asked um even before we started the project to one of the people in the, in the infrastructure group and I said, how is it possible to have open source software and still know that it's secure, right? It feels as if there is a contradiction there. And he said, well, basically, because it's open source, everyone in the world can try to hack it and can have a look at it. And all the vulnerabilities will just come out because so many people have access to it. So actually, and he, he, he gave the example of Linux, which is completely open source and mm -hmm. is used by many, many, many companies for their server software. So actually... Having it open source means that so many people can have a look at it and try to find weaknesses in it. That actually it's the best guarantee to get very strong, secure software. It feels like a contradiction, but it's mm -hmm. actually a very good way of doing it, I think. No, totally. Like self-improvement of a product because the users can contribute to, to improving it. This is yeah. amazing. So guys, another question. Where are you going to have all those slides? And now the discussion is for every organization that is going digital. Oh, what are we doing with the slides? Hard drives is not an option. Can we have a big server? Can we have cloud, AWS? Like, where are they going to be? This is going to be a huge amount of data, if you can say. I don't it's know. Good, like it's, it's a good question. But so it's we an have open two... project, so I'm asking those questions. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, so there will we be have two, two server, right? Yeon, maybe, and you can correct me if I. There will be uh, one. They will be mirrored, so to make sure that it, it's a kind of security and uh, a recovery uh, security. If something happens to one of the of the two, and there will be one in Finland and one in Sweden. Okay. The basic setup is that we will have uh, two copies of all the data as Julie said, but the repository will be built, the technology will be such that it can also be a federated system. So in the future, we could also yeah. have nodes that keep their own data, um, but are still connected to Big Picture and are accessible through Big Picture. And if I'm correct, I think in Finland, they have really a huge bunker in which they will store all the data. In Sweden, it's a local cloud solution. Um, but um, mm -hmm. so there are there's slightly different technologies be behind it. But luckily, we have people that take care of that and we don't have to <laughs> buy, buy the hard disks ourselves. Yeah, oh, yeah. You would have to buy a lot of hard drives. <laughs> I think so, yes. No, that's obviously not an option. But no, I'm just fascinated because it is like people think, oh, digital, it's like not physical anymore, but at some point it becomes physical because you are storing this digital information on hardware. Mm -hmm. And this hardware has to get bigger and, uh, I don't know, larger, more secure, double, because you want a backup because it's digital. It can disappear. You don't want it to disappear. So, no, totally crazy initiative. And that leads me to another question. So there are many packages, six years, many people involved, but you all have uh, your other jobs. 
how are you managing this project on a daily basis? Because do you have people that are full-time employed by this consortium and by EMI or you guys work for your jobs? So how does it happen? Probably past 30 percent of my time on the IMI big picture and in Novartis because we are involved in a lot of different IMI projects there are people that are their job is just IMI just to do that okay. yes and we have some FPA partners uh, that have for example some FTEs that are dedicated to IMI as well and some are just for IMI big picture we have a we have a company a ligature that is a, it's a professional project management company. Um, so they um, they have a few people, probably not completely full time, but really dedicated people that spend a lot of their time on managing the projects. And in addition, we have a lot of people with different partners that spend either their entire time or part of their time on this. Uh, so we have, for instance, a, a communication manager or someone that works one and a half days a week just for communication. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of people. It, it's a, as Judy said, it's a 32 million euro funded project. So we have a lot of people that work for the, for the project. Mm -hmm. And does the funding come uh, partially from from the the members of the consortium and partially from the European Union? Or how does that work? So usually the IMI project, the way they are funded, um, half of it is coming from the pharmaceuticals uh, and the other half is, com is coming from the European Commission. So it's a kind of, uh, they are matching, the European Commission will match the amount of in-kind contribution that the pharmaceutical will be providing. So us, our in-kind for IMI Big Picture is in terms of slides and also people working on the project and then uh, up to uh, uh, 35 million. And then 35 million was provided by the European Commission to pay for the private partners that are uh, involved in the project. So the 36 other partners involved in the project. Mm -hmm. And how does that work for academia, Aaron? Yeah, so we got funded. So we, um, uh, different parties have different roles in the project, which has been defined up front. Every party is, is for instance, responsible for certain deliverables, uh, for certain tasks, and we get funded. So we get uh, different amounts for, uh, for hiring people. Um, for instance, I myself, I am funded one day a week for this project. And next to that, we have a budget. Do you only for... work one day a week or do you work more than that? I work one day a week for Big Picture officially. Um, of course, I don't track the time that that well, but um, officially I'm paid for one day a week for Big Picture. Um, and actually, we have a budget for slides. So uh, partners providing slides can get reimbursed for the costs they make. So they may have to scan. They may have to hire people to upload slides to find metadata. Um, so we have some budget uh, for that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at the moment we said we're 15 months in, let's say it's end of the planning, end of the organization, a little bit of proof of concept on stuff, on, on different uh, aspects. What do you expect to have by uh, done by next year? Because I'm going to invite you again next year and we're going to be talking, okay, what did you do guys? What did go well? What didn't go so well? What's the plan to have accomplished by uh, month 24. Milestone coming up, um, which is the first clinical data uh, that will be uh, put in the database. So this is one of the, the big milestones uh, that, that is coming up, you, the tangible mind, milestone, because we have performed a lot of things in the, in the first year, but it's not the things that people see. It's a little bit like, mm -hmm. you know, when you are doing renovation and there are a lot of things you do behind the walls, but nobody sees it. So this is the first uh, um, really data, real data in the real database, not in a pilot. So it's, uh, we will be learning a lot from that. And uh, at month 30 is when the non-clinical are uploading the data. The, the clinical are, are group are uh, our guinea pigs. <laughs> and us, uh, we will be the second in line, which is great because then they will have like paved the way. So it's going to be way easier for us. So this is coming for month 30. Okay. 
this is exciting so I'm gonna be inviting you next time when this milestone is met or maybe before that thank you so much for taking this time and explaining this um, I think as the project evolves it's gonna be maybe clear and more tangible like you say Julie for people to understand okay what's happening there is software there are slides there is access there is like so many things um, so I'm super curious how it's gonna evolve and thank you so much for joining me today thank you I think you will need to re-invite us probably <laughs> I will no worries no worries you have the invite for next year no problem <laughs> If you're still here, you're fantastic and I know this is really interesting to you. So be sure to subscribe, click the bell below and be notified every time I release a new video. Talk to you in the next episode!